But let's pray, and then I'll introduce myself, and we'll get to, get to rolling on the program here. God, thank you so much that we can come together in this way, that we can come together uh, in person and online and enjoy something together with even a larger group than we may realize. And uh, not only that, but that we can really take part, whether we're unable to be in person or or not. And so, Lord, I just pray that you'll bless that. I pray that you would just have your hand of, of guidance and protection over that side of things as well and uh, not allow the enemy to interfere for those that, that need this. And so, Lord, uh, I believe everyone has come because they feel they need to grow and they want to grow. And so, Lord, I pray that you would bring blessing and insight into their lives. And it would maybe be a step up for them in their Christian walk with you. Or maybe it will be a catalyst to take a step forward in understanding who they are in you and their worth uh, in, in, in your eyes, who they, are tr uh, who they truly are. And so, Lord, I just pray for that, that care, that, uh, that gift, and that insight for each one that's here. In Jesus' name, amen. So I'm Steve. I'm one of the pastors here at First Free, and uh, uh, I'm, a, I'm a husband. I'm a father. I'm a grandfather. Uh, and uh, with, the, with a blended family, with one of my kids, I'm even a step-great-grandfather. So um, we don't see that one very much, but I'm also, I kind of consider myself uh, a gatherer. Uh, I love things like this, uh, bringing people together. I love getting in the outdoors and bringing people together that way. And, um, and so I, I really enjoy uh, things like hiking and camping and, and wilderness tripping and different things like that. That's one of my joys. Uh, it's not one of my wife's, so it's not something we share. Um, she doesn't even like outside, so that's, um, she would tell you that. But we are foodies together. We enjoy doing that together and um, many other things as well. But um, that's a little bit about me. Uh, I, uh, I got my bachelor's in biblical studies um, many years ago. It took me 19 years to get my bachelor's degree. So if you're still working on yours, be encouraged. It can happen. <laughs> so, um, uh, also have a diploma in biblical counseling and currently working on my master's diploma in biblical counseling. So uh, not, a, not a degree, but it's still a lot of work and, and looking forward to that. I want to share a little bit of my experience when I first found out or first learned about Search for Significance, the material, the book. The book is actually not a new new book. If you hadn't heard of it, it's not new. Um, if you're familiar with it, you know that. And uh, But it's been around, uh, I think, 22 years or something like that. But my first experience is with it wasn't the book that many of you are holding in your hands or on your lap right now. My experience with it was a student version of that. Uh, many years ago, there was a national youth speaker, a national youth guru, if you might call him that, in the youth ministry uh, named Dawson McAllister. And uh, I think he's still around, but I don't hear much about him anymore. But I used to follow him, some of his work. Uh, he had a radio program and lots of, lots of good things for young people uh, back in the day. Um, but he had written a student edition with Robert McGee on Search for Significance. So it was a youth edition, uh, student edition, a Search for Significance. And as a pastor, I got a hold of that and fell in love with it and used it to, to teach in the youth group and the youth ministry. And not only did it help the, the kids and the young people I was working with, but it helped me a lot as I was going through that. And so that was my first introduction to it, but it was a, uh, the beginning of helping me see and I mean, see life, see who I am and see others even through God's eyes. And so that was my introduction to it. Um, I was thrilled to find that they had done a few years later, a little bit of an update and revision. Um, there is some videos out there that Robert McGee has done, but you're not going to see them. They're old and not very good quality. And so maybe someday they'll update that as well. But but for now, you just have me. Um, some of the things you can expect as we go forward here, 
there's some good news and bad news. I kind of alluded to it earlier, and that is uh, we're not going to go real deep in this book. Uh, we just can't with the time that we've given it. And you might say, well, why didn't you give it more time? Well, there's a lot scheduled. And uh, this was something that we could do in January. It was something, it's a topic that I felt was, was really cr crucial at this time uh, for many of us struggling with isolation and just different things going on in our world and wondering where we fit in all of that. And I think it's a good timing for that. Um, but well, we're not gonna do an in-depth study, but we will cover the whole book. We will cover, we will go over it um, and give you some insight in it. But what you can do is go through the book on your own. And then each week it will address those topics um, that are in the book. In your book, if you haven't noticed it already, if you haven't opened it yet, um, it's basically half the book and the other half, the back half, is a workbook on the text. And it is phenomenal. The way the workbook um, helps you think deeper, helps you answer questions, helps you address things that maybe you haven't addressed before or thought about before, or maybe ignored before. And uh, so it's a tremendous tool. And I really believe that uh, the work you do on your own will really help determine the impact this series has for you. Um, so a little bit of that onus is being put on you um, as normally it should be. We wanna grow, right? So that's what's there. But I'll teach the subject and provide as much insight as I can on the lessons from the book. Uh, but I will challenge you to follow up with the reading and with the, the workbook in the back. There's a lot of work to be done. And it, you might not finish in four weeks either, um, unless you have some, a lot of extra time, you probably won't, and that's okay. But I would encourage you to keep at it. Um, the, the people that have, have really received a lot from it and have really grown in their Christian life. And so that's my encouragement to you. Um, let's look at a slide I have of just kind of a preview of what we're gonna cover in the next four weeks. So week one is an we're going to introduce things as I'm already kind of doing now, um, and then we'll enter into um, the performance trap and, uh, and dealing with uh, you know feeling we have to do certain things to feel good about ourselves, right? Dealing with the performance trap, we're going to talk about that tonight, but also God's answer to that, God's answer to that lie. Uh, and that is justification. So that's where we're going to be tonight. That's chapters one through four of the book. You'll see that there on the slide. Uh, next week, we'll be covering what's in chapters five and six. Um, and that's the approval trap. Uh, feeling like we have to have certain people's approval or be thought of what we what others think of us is uh, really impacts how we think about ourselves and how we feel about our self-worth. So looking at the approval trap, but also then God's answer to that lie of reconciliation and what that means. So excited to, to do that. Week three, chapter seven and eight, we'll look at the blame game and God's answer of propitiation and understanding what that means. Week four, our last week, uh, the shame game and God's answer of regeneration and then also some summary and bringing it all together. So it's kind of a whirlwind approach. Um, and uh, But I hope it's you, you find it helpful and I hope you find insight for yourself from God uh, to, to be encouraged. Um, you'll want your book, because um, we're going to refer to that from time to time. Um, and uh, your Bible would be helpful, but for the most part, any Bible references during class, uh, I'll put on a slide um, and then a pen, because uh, you can write in your book. You can actually, even while we're talking, you can look at the workbook, where it lines up with the chapter, and uh, feel free to work on that during class while we're talking. That's okay. Um, you may not be taking notes on what I'm saying, but you're taking notes on what was said or what uh, you're thinking about, what it's ca caused you to think about. And so feel free to take a look at that and browse through the workbook. In, in fact, if you want uh, to know where we're, we're going to be tonight, if you go to the back page, I'm sorry, the back half of the book, which starts, by the way, on page 155. 
And the step one, instead of chapters or lessons, the workbook is called steps. So step one is kind of where we're gonna to start tonight. And then uh, step two, we're not gonna really deal with that, but there's some good helps in there for you. And then step three and step four are the performance trap, which is the lie we'll address tonight and God's answer. So those four chapters, those four steps, uh, a lot of opportunity for you to journal, a lot of opportunity for you to learn and grow. So uh, that's for you. And I, my encouragement again is for you to do all you can to implement that. All right, so our first challenge tonight is actually gonna be interaction. Um, so uh, I don't wanna spend the next four weeks uh, lecturing. That wouldn't be a lot of fun for any of us. Um, I don't, I, my style of teaching is really a lot of interaction. There may be a little less of that because of the involvement of, uh, of the on viewers, but I think it's helpful that we have questions. And when I ask questions, that's for everyone, not just people here, that's for everyone online as well. And like I said, use the raise hand, use the chat feature, and we'll try to address you just like we're addressing people uh, in, in the room here. So be ready for that. As far as I know, this is the uh, first for us at First Free to do something in person and live at the same time. We live stream, but that's not interactive. Um, so with Zoom and that, so uh, I think we got it, but uh, bear with us. If something doesn't quite go right, we'll do our best and get it fixed uh, best we can for next time. Um, so if it's interactive, why not start with a question, right? So that's what we're gonna do. We're gonna start with a question. And uh, the point of where we're starting out is we have to be honest with ourselves and with God in order to uh, defeat, in order to combat these lies that we sometimes believe in, we sometimes live with. Um, so that's what we want to start out with, is addressing the issue of being honest with ourselves, allowing God to open up areas in our life that we need to address. Lies that we've believed, whether realizing it or not, but through our actions, through our behavior, through different uh, things that we've allowed the lies to impact our lives. So before we go to the question that I'm gonna open up for, let's pray and ask God's continued guidance on the rest of our night together as well. God, I really wanna immerse this series in prayer. Even as we started out that way, Lord, I wanna just again return to you and ask that your Holy Spirit fill uh, every living room, every kitchen, wherever people are sitting at, uh, online, and this room here where people are in person and, and fill us. May we be tuned in to what you have for us and opened to what you have for us. We also ask for your protection of holding back the enemy and his negative input of people feeling like this isn't worth my time. This isn't going to help. I'm not, whatever the case, Lord, that you would protect us from that. Everyone that's here, Lord, would be under your care as we continue forward. So we give that to you. We ask for your blessing, your guidance, and your protection. In Jesus' name, amen. All right, the question we're going to put on the uh, slide as well. It's our next slide, and uh, that is think Think of your greatest achievement and your worst failure or when you were most terribly rejected by someone. How did you feel about yourself after you had succeeded? Or how did you feel about yourself after you had failed or were rejected? So there's a couple different things to think about here. And if it helps, there's something that you have a real experience that might be helpful to someone that you feel comfortable sharing. Uh, that you don't want to go into detail. Maybe you don't even want to say what the situation was, but you can share the latter part, how it made you feel about this great success, uh, how, about who you were, how it made you feel about being rejected or how it made you feel. So maybe just that part without going into detail on what the item was. If you can do that or want to do that, that's great too. So the question is here. It's there for you to read and think about. We're going to just give a, a couple minutes here to see if someone could 
could respond to that and, and share some insight for all of us. Maybe we're starting out too tough. Huh? Oh, we got one. Go ahead. When I was in high school, we were going to leave. I think that's just the principal told me that I wasn't going to make anything of myself. But... Okay. I'm going to uh, kind of interpret you okay. because our online viewers can't hear Sorry. you. No, so I'm going to get kind of just sections and try to interpret okay. kind of like an interpreter would. Right. So, um, so when he was in high school, you had a principal say something to you. Yep. He said that I would amount to nothing. The principal and told him he would amount. He wouldn't amount to anything. And uh, the, it felt like I needed to prove myself. So he felt like he just needed to prove himself. So I had already signed up for the military. So I went in and actually uh, became a green beret. Okay. Wow. <laughs> he had. Uh, <laughs> If you heard the clapping, what he shared was uh, in wanting to prove that, uh, prove that he was something, worth something. He had already signed up for the military, but after hearing that, he went into the military and it ended up becoming a Green Beret, which is no small feat. So that's awesome. That's that's huge. That's a beautiful success. How'd that make you feel about yourself? Um, at first, I was exhausted. <laughs> <laughs> at first, he was exhausted. <laughs> It, it was it was a revelation mm. that I could actually do anything I put my mind to. Awesome. It was a revelation to him that he could actually do anything he set his mind to. Awesome. Thanks for sharing that. Yes. Another hand in the back here. Um, I would say like about a year ago, um, I was going through like a really rough time and I didn't make the most like or best choices and um, I got pregnant and it was a result of a gay break. Okay. A few years ago, a young lady that's sharing um, had some bad choices, but she uh, ended up uh, getting pregnant from a date rape. And her father wanted me to abort her. And it made me feel really worse. And I felt like it was my fault for putting myself in that situation. Mm. Her, the, the father uh, expected her to uh, abort the baby, uh, made her feel worse, as if all of this was her fault. Um, but I felt like once I had her, I realized I loved her. Mm. And I felt like I'm going to enjoy her life. Mm. Mm. When and she. Back to the Lord, so. Oh, beautiful. Oh, yeah. Okay. So when she wraps things up there, uh, when she had the baby, she realized she loved her, wanted to give her life, and uh, then turned herself over to the Lord, and uh, God's continued to work her. Beautiful. Thank you for sharing. That's beautiful. We have one online there? No? Okay. Yeah. Um, I have two beautiful kids. Okay. And I've known a lot of people that um, have had a hard time having kids or wanting kids. So I went into this one. This, that's all right. This, uh, this woman has uh, the sharing um, in the room here, uh, has two beautiful girls, and she uh, is all, also knows people that have tried to have kids and can't have kids. So I went through the DA's therapist, and I actually did it three times for two different kids. So she looked into being a surrogate and actually did it three times for three different families. And there's, it, it's, there's four total, the last two were twins. Oh. <laughs> and that was two years ago. Wow, there's four total and two of them were twins. <laughs> and they're, they, they were um, from the parents, so it was their embryo, so it has nothing to do with They were them. completely from the parents, their embryo, nothing to do with you. At, at, uh, you got a lot to do with you. <laughs> That's good. All right. All right. Thank you. Thank you. All right. Don't want to miss anybody, but this is beautiful. Um, but isn't it, isn't it um, 
helpful to hear how what happens, what we're told or what we see in culture or what we're told in life really impacts how we feel about ourselves. And sometimes that happens at a very vulnerable age and we never really heal from that. We never really grow out of that. Um, we might be aware of it. We might say, yeah, I know, but I'm, I'm, I've moved on. But maybe we really haven't. Maybe we haven't allowed God to redeem that, to come in and, and really find healing from that. And that's a lot of what we want to see happen uh, in this series. Um, Psalm 139 is our next slide. Psalm 139, verses 23 and 24 says, search me, O God, and know my heart. Test me and know my anxious thoughts. See if there is any offensive way in me and lead me in the way of everlasting. One of the uh, most profound steps of moving forward and, and accepting and understanding who you truly are and your worth in God's eyes is, is to ask God to search you to, and to open yourself to him. That's that honesty part I mentioned earlier, being honest with yourself of what's, what, what hurts, the wounds. Guys especially, I think we have more trouble with that in dealing with wounds, uh, wounds from our dad, wounds from maybe our mom, wounds from other family members, wounds from principals, wounds from other people that, that really did hurt. You know, they say sticks and stones, they break my bones, but words will never hurt me. That's a lie, right? We know that's a lie. They do hurt because they, they affect our thinking and they affect how we think about ourselves. And we those are, are uh, really the enemy bringing lies into our life. And he's hoping that it completely twists our thinking and that we do think that way, that we're not good enough, that we're not going to amount to anything, that we can, we'll never do anything right, whatever the case may be. And that's simply not true. So inviting God to search us, as the psalmist said, as David said, search my heart, know me, test me, know my anxious thoughts. What's going on? What's causing that? Help me to, to see that. Help me to expose it to you and help me to give it to you for healing. And uh, that's a big step for us uh, and something that we can all practice and work on. Many of us are hurt emotionally. Many of us are hurt relationally and spiritually, um, but sometimes we remain unaware of where that hurt lies, or, he, or maybe not unaware that we were hurt, but unaware of the extent of our wounds and how they're affecting our behavior, how they're affecting uh, how we treat others or our relationships. We don't take steps toward healing and health like we should because we're just not aware of that. And it's not because we're stupid. It's not because we uh, are ignorant, but it's a lack of objectivity. It's, it's a lack of some, and in some ways, being honest with ourselves and really looking at what's there, really looking at what was said to me, really looking at how I believed about myself and where that belief came from. And so we really wanna address those things. We have to be honest with ourselves. I'll say it again, and with God about dealing with uh, these different wounds and these things that we uh, hopefully will address as we move forward. Robert McGee in his book, he calls it turning the light on. That's that first chapter, right? Um, uh, I don't remember exactly what the title is, but that's what he's saying, turn, turn the light on to the situation. That's what he wants us to do. Uh, and to me, uh, he calls it turning the light on. And I love that. To me, it's I refer to this, and you'll hear me say this from time to time in different lessons, there's a get it factor to things. You know, when you can know something, you can believe it, but oftentimes, you know, you want to say, do you get it? Do you really get it? Um, and there's oftentimes we don't. And that's part of growing in the Christian life. And I really believe it's the get it factor, this idea of opening things up, our spiritual reality. And we're going to talk about that a little bit more, but our spiritual reality, what I mean by that is who I am in Christ. If you're a believer in Christ, you are in Christ. Your identity rests in him. Your identity rests in the body uh, of Christ. He 
is he is where our worth comes from. And uh, so our spiritual reality must transcend our earthly existence. It must transcend who we think we are on this earth. Um, I kind of think of it as we are here, but we're, we're part of God's kingdom, right? We're part of his world, uh, not just on the earth. Uh, we talked about that a few weeks ago in a message uh, in Ephesians of uh, a third race, uh, not uh, the Jews and the Gentiles became Christians. Uh, they were still that by still Jew or Gentile by ethnicity, um, but ultimately they were they were Christians. That was who they identified as now. And that was a whole new culture. And that's kind of what we're talking about here. Our spiritual reality, the identity of who we are, in Christ should and must transcend who we think we are on this earth and in the, in the uh, horizontal, because that's truly who we are. That's the truth. And there's the get it factor of when that identity, our identity in Christ begins to enter into our soul and into our thinking and replaces the lies that say our identity is all about something else, performance, approval, uh, the shame, whatever it might be. And so we want to change that. We want to allow ourselves to get that. Um, uh, an author by the name of uh, Bill Galtier, uh, he wrote it this way, and I, I love this. He says, to the extent that we learn to live today in spiritual reality with the risen Christ, drawing our sustenance and identity from there rather than from our physical bodies, and visible circumstances. We will not be overcome by the trials of life, nor will we fear the cessation of our bodies. Instead, we'll be learning to live on planet Earth from the unseen heavens and will rejoice to one day completely leave this world for that glorious one. Now, first of all, I apologize for not putting that on a slide. That, that probably would have helped. Um, to be honest with you, it came late. I, I uh, was continuing to read and uh, I just had to put it in. So I'm gonna read it again for you. And if you want, uh, email me and I'll send it out to you. It might be something worth meditating on a little bit. Um, but he said, to the extent that we learn to live today in spiritual reality with the risen Christ, drawing our sustenance and identity from there rather than from our physical bodies and visible circumstances, we will not be overcome by the trials of life, nor will we fear the cessation of our bodies. Instead, we'll be learning to live on planet Earth from the unseen heavens and will rejoice to one day completely leave this world for that glorious one. That's a beautiful understanding of our existence. And there's something about our supernatural, our spiritual existence that, that we as believers need to get. And it's not weird. It's it's not you know some uh, I don't know weird thing that's happening, right? As a believer, we have we have come into Christ, and the whole supernatural has has taken us, and we belong in the supernatural. We belong in the spiritual. That's who we are. It's real. It's not just something that that we ascend our mentally ascend to. It is our existence. We are in Christ. We are, are uh, uh, belonging to God's family. And heaven is our home. And this is just our earthly existence. And we are, we are aliens in this world in a real way. Not just in a, a, a theoretical way, but in a very real way. And when we get that, it will help us as we you know that will help transcend the the earthly things that hold us down and hold us back for the believer we're made new and that's part of the get it factor the new creation but there's some other things that scripture says about this get it factor the spiritual life that we have and here's just a few more scriptures in regards to that the next slide will show us a few um, there's actually many i just picked out three to, to share with you. And uh, the first one is 2 Corinthians 13 and, and verse 5. 
Examine yourself to see whether you are in the faith. Test yourselves. Do not do you not realize that Christ Jesus is in you? So this is that being honest with yourself part. And this is that trying to, to understand that I am in Christ. I am a new, create, a new creature. Um, and that identity needs to transcend everything else I've heard about me. Everything else I've heard about me. And so I need to examine myself. Now there's a caveat there to see whether you are in the faith. But in the overall idea there is to test yourselves, to let examine yourself, allow yourself to open yourself up and see the lies that maybe have been uh, leading you in your behaviors and in your thoughts. And then, it, but it ends with, "Do not realize that Christ Jesus is in you. You and Christ are embodied in one, and uh, that's a beautiful thing." First Peter one fourteen, as obedient children. Do not conform to the evil desires you had when you lived in ignorance. There's, a, there's, a, there's an ignorance of, of uh, living in the lies and um, allowing the Holy Spirit to teach us so that we don't conform to that. Somebody's got a phone that's going off. Okay. <laughs> uh, didn't know if you could hear it or not. Um, so 1 John chapter 3, verse 20 is our, our third one there. If our hearts condemn us, and isn't that what happens when we, when we struggle with self-worth? Our hearts are condemning us. If our hearts condemn us, we know that God is greater than our hearts. The spiritual transcends the physical, and he knows everything. There's some belief issues here. That's what's at the root of the majority, if not all, emotional issues. Um, now, there's, uh, now I'm not saying mental issues, emotional issues. Uh, it's actually at the root of a lot of mental struggles and mental health issues too. But there's also a lot of science or a lot of physical things that are that cause that as well. And so that's a mixed bag. But if our heart condemns us, if we if we uh, feel less about ourselves, or if we don't think we me measure up, if we don't think we're good enough, and on and on the list can go, right? Or we've been shamed, we've been blamed. Um, that's our heart condemning us. We know that God is greater than our hearts. It says we know that. And so do we live that? That's, that's the transition, and I think that's when the get it factor comes into play, reminding us that he knows everything. So if you think, well, he doesn't know this about me. Yeah, he does, <laughs> right? He knows everything. There is nothing beyond his, his reach. So for the believer, we're made new, a new creation. But even when we realize that and we become a new creation, sometimes, as a, even as a believer, we continue to... Uh, we continue to struggle with the emotional strongholds and the emotional setbacks or find ourselves returning back to them, those struggles. But we're instructed, not only here, but another verse that I don't have a slide for, Galatians 2.20. Maybe write that down. Galatians 2.20, it it's a beautiful verse, but it basically reminds us, I no longer live, but Christ lives in me. We are completely changed. We are completely new. We have an identity in Christ, and who he is is who we have in ourself, is who we are. This class is called A Search for Significance, and uh, as humans, we're made for significance. You are made for significance. Um, hopefully you know that. That's probably why you're here. Or you're doubting that, and you'd like to know that, and that's why you're here. But so often we fall into the enemy's formula of who we, of learning who we are, rather than God's. So often we fall into what either the enemy is telling us, or what the earthly people are telling us have told us that are also wounded and broken, instead of what God has told us. And that's, that's, a, that's a process. 
God does supply us, however, with the essentials for discovering our true significance and worth. We see that in creation, right? And Robert McGee touches on this. In the creation of man, we see his intended purpose for man is to honor God and his true value. He is a creation of God. God created him. He's a special creation of God, completely unique. In fact, um, if you look at the, the creation account, everything he created was good. When he created man, it was what? Very good. You haven't noticed that before. Take a look at that. You are special. And not only you as, a, as humanity, but you individually, because that's how God looks at you. Maybe some homework for you. Uh, this just comes to mind. It's speaking, uh, speaking to me. Uh, um, Psalm 139 is a chapter I encourage you to read and reread and meditate on. Um, maybe make it a 21-day challenge. I don't know where that came from, but, uh, <laughs> but Psalm 139 is beautiful because it shows us who God looks at us and who God thinks us that thinks of us or how God thinks of us. Sorry, get my English right. Um, it tells us that he, he knows us. He loves us. He's with us. He made us. He'll lead us. He'll, he'll bring victory for us. And that's all from an Old Testament psalmist. So that's who God looks at us. I mean, that's how God looks at us. And that's a beautiful psalm to, re to be reminded. So that's, that, that was a freebie, <laughs> as if the rest of this isn't. But, um, our goal in this series is not just to help us feel better about ourselves, although that's a beautiful thing. That's important. But it's not just that, because if it was just that, it would be pretty humanistic. Our goal is not just to feel better about ourselves, but to learn how to apply God's truth and answers to our feelings and to our problems. And I'll be honest, that takes time. It takes time to learn how to apply God's truth that we want to believe, and maybe we do believe, but to truly apply it to our feelings and to our problems. And when it comes to that, one of the things that, that's been addressed in this, in this uh, study is two possible options that we can choose when we determine our self-worth. And when we're thinking about who we are, when we're thinking about our self-worth, self-esteem, whatever you want to call it, right? Our self-worth, there's two possible options. And that's what I want to show you on the next slide here. Uh, it's in your book too. But there's the world system and God's system. I think we're very familiar with the world system. Self-worth, that's dependent on my performance and what others' opinions are of me. That's the world system. That's the enemy system, if you will. How good you are or how good you're not, that's how worthy you are. Others' opinions, whether they think I am or think I'm not, that's really who I am. That's the world system. But God's system, and here's a truth nugget. I've written in my notes, in big, big uh, bold letters, truth. <laughs> I want you to get this. God's system right here is one of those. Self-worth equals God's truth about you, period. What does God say about you? We, we can read it. We can hear it. We can know it. We can even maybe believe it, but is it transcending the other beliefs that we've carried with us? Are we allowing it? Are we learning to apply it to our hurts and to our feelings and allowing God to use it to heal us? It takes time. It takes process. There's, other, there's things we can do. Uh, inner healing prayer is a great way to enter into some of those things and, and address some of those hurts that are that the enemy's using that maybe we don't realize how much he's using. But as you look at those two systems, what difference would it make for you if you fully grasp God's system? 
if you fully got it, what difference would it make for you if you fully got it, that system, and it was embraced completely by you? What difference would it make in your attitude? Just think about that for a moment, whether you're uh, online or here, just think about that for a minute. What difference would it make in your attitude? Can you identify a couple things specifically? I'm gonna give you just a moment to think because it's a process. What difference would it make for you in a relationship? What difference would embracing the truth that who you are, your self-worth, is what God says about you, fully embracing that. Now, remember, you can't have two systems, but that's what's happening for a lot of us, isn't it? We're battling two systems, trying to live with two systems. And so to fully embrace God's system is nixing the world system in our thinking and in our heart and in our minds. And so what difference would it make if you fully embraced God's system and allowed the healing to take place and went through that process in some of your relationships? What about some of your goals? What difference would it make some of the goals that you have? Remember what our brother said earlier, realize he could do anything he put his mind to. A high schooler who was told he'd never amount to anything, now Green Beret, maybe not now. <laughs> always. 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 Yes, I'm sorry. Yep, that's right. Always. It's like, uh, that's what they say, right? Once a, once a Marine, always a Marine. Once, yep. So, always. That's awesome. What difference would it make? Here's another truth for you. Another truth bomb. All right. And here's another one that came later. Sometimes things happen and I just, I got to throw them in. But this is something that I, I would encourage you. Uh, and I'll say it a couple of times so you can write it down. This is a shorter one. But say it. Repeat it. Post it dashboard or your mirror, your refrigerator, say it, repeat it, post it, meditate on it, spend some time with it. It's not scripture, but it, the, the truth comes from scripture. And here's the statement. My true value is based not on my behavior or the approval of others but on what God's word says is true of me. I'll break it up. My true value, my true value is based not on my behavior, is based not on my behavior or the approval of others. or the approval of others, but on what God's word says about me. But on what God's word says is true of me, I should say. But on what God's word says is true of me. If you wrote it down, whether you're online, you, I don't want you to turn your mic on, but speak it out loud, all right? We're all going to do this together. You wrote it down. You got it. If not yet, um, do your best. My true value is based not on my behavior or the approval of others, but on what God's word says is true of me. Amen. It's on page 19 of your book. Actually, so page 19, I made you write it down. <laughs> but that's part of it, right? You'll remember it better. Write it down. Some of you are, are, are learners that way. Some of you are not. 
reading, writing, speaking it, find every way. All right, let's dig right into um, the performance trap. All right, there's uh, the performance trap is simply feeling that I must meet certain standards in order to feel good about myself. So my self-worth is dependent on me meeting certain standards. That plays out in a lot of different ways, depending on our personality and depending on, on our life. But that's what a perform that's what the performance trap is, and that's what the the enemy's lie is that I must meet certain standards in order to feel good about myself. And sometimes that comes from being told that you can't meet certain standards. And so you don't feel good about yourself because you're being told that you can't, you're, you're, you're not worth it, you're not worthy. Like the young girl who uh, invested herself in piano lessons and worked hard at learning the piano and playing the piano and every recital she would go to for her piano recital and her mom would come along and she would play a beautiful recital, a beautiful song for the recital and it would go well, but no matter what, no matter how well she played, no matter what song she played, she would always hear from her mom that she could have done this better, she could have done that better, she could have done that better. Never good enough. Some of those lies continue to breed and to fester and they become our, our, our way of thinking about ourselves. They really infect. And this is one of Satan's biggest lies that I think has been human, one of humanity's Achilles heel, if you will, from the beginning. The next slide, please. Paul warns us in Colossians chapter 2, verse 8, in regards to this. See to it that no one takes you captive through philosophy and empty deception, according to the tradition of man, according to the elementary principles of the world, rather than according to Christ. See to it, he says, be warned that no one takes you captive. And that belief that you have to be good enough, that you have to meet certain standards in order to feel good about yourself, is Satan holding you by the chains, holding you captive. And God doesn't want that for you. He wants to release you from that. He wants to unlock those chains and open you up to who you are and help you see who you are in Christ. See to it that no one takes you captive. Well, it's easy said than done, isn't it? I know. But being here is a step that you're taking. Allowing yourself to think more about it is a step worth taking. Here's another truth for you. Through his spirit, through the Holy Spirit, we can overcome the deep beliefs that hold us captive. And often they hold us captive, captive with us unaware. We don't realize why we're so critical of others. We don't realize why we get so mad when someone gets in our way of trying to accomplish something. We don't, we, maybe we're not aware of why sometimes. Sometimes we are, sometimes we're not. But either way, his spirit is able to overcome any belief, any false belief that's a stronghold in our life. That's a truth we need to hang on to and believe and allow to transcend any other belief that says it's not possible for me because it is. And some of this sounds like at times, it's like, you know, it's good church word. Uh, it, it's, it's good truth, but boy, it just doesn't, I just, it's hard. The practical side is hard. The practical side of taking that belief and allowing it to permeate and transcend what, what we think about ourselves is a process. 
but engaging in that process, agreeing to be honest with yourself and engaging in that process is a, is a, is a step that, that you can take and it's helpful. Our book lists at least three ways that we um, may be responding to this false belief of the performance trap of that I need to meet certain standards in order to feel good about myself. And some of the ways that, that we respond, uh, some of you might, uh, might be perfectionist. Um, so when we deal with that issue of meeting certain standards or we, we, maybe we were told we weren't good enough or in order to be good enough, we had to be this because if we weren't this, then we weren't good enough or whatever the case may be, then we've become, in some ways we've responded because of the type of personality we have. And now we're perfectionists. And a perfectionist is someone that's unwilling to fail. It's, it's not something that they wanna deal with. They're a, they have an unwillingness to fail because if they fail, that will threaten your self-worth. And your self-worth is based on your performance. So you're a perfectionist. Make sure everything does done right. If you want it right, if you want it done right, you're gonna do it yourself. Another side of that is despair. It's interesting, it's kind of a, an opposite side. A, a perfectionist is very, you know, go, go forward, go strong and do it myself because I gotta make sure it's done right. Uh, then the, the other side of that is despair. And that's where we turn the fear and the anger response and we turn, out, we turn that inward. And we, we tend to give up, tend to lose hope. And we really struggle with even just having any hope or desire or, or uh, positive thoughts. And then a third way that we, we tend to respond is through a rules dominated life. Uh, it's, it's, there's some similarities to perfectionism in that but what the rules dominated life wants to do, it wants to set up in order to accomplish what I feel I need to accomplish to feel good about myself. I'm gonna make sure all of this is in place. I'm gonna make sure I have all the parameters I need in my life, all the, the people in my life that I need or all the uh, objectives set. Um, I'm gonna put all kinds of rules and parameters and things in my life to make sure that, they, that it happens. Um, I think OCD comes out of that, obsessive compulsive disorder. But rules protect. You feel rules protect you and they barricade from uh, negative attempts at what you're trying to accomplish or the standards you're trying to meet. In all three of those and, and many others, those are just a, a few, three key ones, but the underlying result in all of those is a fear of failure. And the truth is it affects us deeper than we think. That fear of failure truly is a, is a lie uh, from the enemy to hold us back and to hold us down. The next slide just says, let's take five minutes. And I wanna do that whether you're online uh, or here in person and on page 32 of your book, if you don't have a book with you, um, just spend some time praying. <laughs> um, but hopefully you have a book with you. And this is a chance for you to write in your book. Um, just wanna make sure I got the right page. There should be on page 32, a little questionnaire. It says fear of failure test. All right. And so I want you just to take five minutes to follow the instructions there and take that and then go through the score and just kind of review that and see what's there for you. We're not gonna ask you to divulge your, your answers or, or anything, but let's do that. Let's take five minutes and do your fear of failure test.
I, someone has an ebook. That is a good question, but it should be in the chapter, uh, the performance trap chapter. And then it's uh, maybe a couple pages in. Sorry, I don't know the page number on the ebook. about another minute <clears throat> we'll bring you back together here All right, let's uh, get back at it. And uh, I'm not going to, like I say, I'm not going to follow up and ask you to share anything. That's for you. It's a little process for you to think through and, uh, and then just continue the journey there in your book. Um, but let that be a, a, uh, a learning experience, I guess. Let that be uh, a, an eye opener maybe for some or uh, something to reveal for you and then just let God use that uh, to continue to to heal and to, to, to bring growth in your life. There's four areas on that list. Uh, one through 10, I think it is. Um, there's four areas that I had a big struggle with, um, especially in one time of my life. And in one situation, I can give an example um, probably about 20 years ago, I was, uh, I was a senior pastor at the time in a church in Minnesota. And one of the things we did in our church, it was a smaller church, but one of the things we did every, every Easter was the passion play. 
And our little church um, actually did a, a, a beautiful job, uh, I'll, if I may say so myself, at putting on this passion play. Um, the, the people in the church, that they just went all out, uh, costumes, makeup, everything, and set. Uh, just, they really gave themselves to it, invited the community to it. Um, the church was a church of about only a hundred, um, but we would have, uh, we'd have it for three nights and there'd be like three, 400 people, uh, each night and packing out the, the church that we had. Um, it was a lot of fun, but, uh, the role I played, uh, I had hair then, <laughs> but even then I got a wig, um, because I played Jesus. Um, had the beard and everything, and um, go, so going through the passion play, that was a, a, a phenomenal experience for me in itself, um, but also there's just the, the drama side of it, right, the acting, and but it was a musical too, so we sang a lot of songs, and so as Jesus, I had um, a couple of songs that I did, and one in particular was a duet with, with Mary uh, at the tomb, and this, it was a powerful song. Um, actually, no, it wasn't that song. Forgive me. It was a song where I'm in the Garden of Gethsemane. And uh, there was a solo for me there. And it was a powerful song. And uh, I practiced it and practiced it. And, you know, I have, I sing, but I'm not going to sing on stage here. So uh, that's not going to happen. Um, and I, one of the things I struggle with is, is pitch. So I just don't have a good musical ear. I can be right there, but my choir director uh, always told me I made up notes. <laughs> so, <laughs> somehow I found notes that didn't exist. <laughs> but, um, but singing in this play, I would practice and then I would worry about, you know, the job I was gonna do. I would worry about, you know, singing it right or hitting the notes and, and this and that. And I would just, you know, just, that would be my, my heartache. And just, I would just be all messed up uh, going into that, that weekend of performances. And, and it affected my relationship with my wife. I remember she would get upset with me. And then she finally, she actually shared with me some truth um, of, of uh, you know, who I am in God. But some of the things I was dealing with was number two on that list, the fear of failure test. When I sense that I might experience failure in some important area, I become nervous and anxious. And I was sensing that I would, that I would fail, that I would mess up the song that was supposed to be such an important song and an important time. And, um, and it could be powerful, but it could be very scary. And, um, but uh, so that created a significant amount of, of nervousness and anxiety in me. Um, and affected my my relationships as well going into that time i worried number three i worried a lot about it i worried whether i was going to hit the notes right whether i was going to remember all the words or whatever the case and um just worried a lot about that number four i have unexplained anxiety that just carried on uh carried on with it and then number 10 i became very self-critical that that you know, well, I mess up all the time, or, you know, I just became very self-critical. That was, so those four areas were very key areas that I can uh, relate to in that very specific situation of feeling not worthy, not good enough. I'm not going to be able to perform well enough and be thought of as, oh, you did a good job or anything. So it was just, it was just destroying me. And one of the things my wife helped me understand and I don't know that I got it, but it helped uh, a little bit at, at the time. It was, uh, uh, was that you've done all the work, you've practiced, you know it, just trust God. You know, she had a way of, of sharing that with me um, and uh, just allowing God to be who he was in me and, and not worry about how it came out. Let God take care of the details and the results. Uh, I did what I could and let him take care of the results. Easier said than done, right? But, uh, but that was something I struggled with. That's a little bit of my story in one specific uh, situation where this area of, of performance, of being, you know, meeting a certain standard, because some of the other singers in, in that church were phenomenal. And I'm just this 
it's a guy that likes to belt out a, a baritone and whether I'm on or not, you know. Um, I can sing a good Elvis, though. I can do that for you. Yeah, you <laughs> but we all have our, our scenarios and our stories. And for some of us, though, it's more than just a situation here and there, right? For some of us, it just permeates our life. I've got another question here that we can we can think on. It's on the, the next slide. Um, actually, uh, why do people use performance as a measurement of personal worth? Why do we do that? And then how does this affect our relationships? How would you answer that? Why do people use performance as a measurement of our personal worth? Yeah. I think it starts right from kids. Okay. You know, when we're little, you know, a lot of it's how your parents raise you, you know, but, you know, same thing, you know, you're not good enough or just like the principal told him or, you know, if you try to play sports and you can't do that and you can't do this. And, and you know, I think it just starts, we, we see those rock star athletes around us, all our friends, you know, and, and it's like, man, they're so good at everything they do. And, you know, at least we so think I, so, right? Yeah. Mm, yeah. So she, so what, uh, what she's saying is that she thinks it starts a lot of times when we're kids, when we're little, um, what we deal with and what we see around us, um, we'll often see, uh, as she said, the, the rock star athletes and everything, and how they're good at everything, and and we don't measure up to that. And uh, maybe in our own family. Maybe in our own family. Yeah. You know, you, you know, we have one sibling that excels and overachiever, and the other one struggles. You know. Yep. So you just, yeah, I think it's even within a family that. with different siblings, one may excel and the other one doesn't. Overachiever, different things that you struggle with. Good. Mm -hmm. Got one online here. Forgive me for covering your screen. Um, Bonnie says, we've been taught that in school, if you can't perform to standards of the system, you're not important. Yeah. You get a lot of nods on that one. Yeah. Fear of rejection, Mark and Mary says. Fear of rejection. Isn't it interesting what Bonnie said about the system? The culture tells us that, doesn't it? This earthly world tells us that, doesn't it? Yeah. Got another one here. I was just going to say, uh, like social media has children who can make it with like a fantasized life for little kids and for like young adults, and they're like, oh, I don't want to do that. Yeah. But behind curtains, there's like other things going on that they don't know about. Like, so. yeah, okay. So uh, she's saying that social media does that for us, kind of fantasizes what what life looks like it, it is, but behind the scenes, it, it's not like that really at all. And even I think sometimes, uh, in fact, I think you'll read some stories in the book um, about some individuals who, who may have been very strong performers in whatever it was they were doing, athletes or business or success, um, on the outside, very successful, but behind the scenes, dealing with this very issue of that's their self-worth and how hard that is to deal with, right? Here's another one from Melissa. Those who have drifted from God's worth teach us that we need to follow the system too. They feel worthless and can't imagine another person feeling better than them. Thank you, yes, that's good. Did I miss one here? I think I may have missed one. Oh, Melanie said, that's how we feel accepted. By perf yep. Excellent. Well, in society, too, Steve, you know, our parents, they, that same thing with social media. Yeah, and society, you know, our parents. Some people struggle with that. Mm -hmm. Yes. Okay. Performance is, she said, is easily and quickly measured. And so anything that takes time, 
um, doesn't seem to be as important for us to, to measure ourselves by. You know, that's, we see that in, again in our culture. Um, I think of uh, the NFL, for instance, sports. It's definitely a what have you done for me today, a world out there, isn't it? Not only in sports, but in a lot of areas of life, it's what have you done for me today? I remember my dad uh, talking about, uh, and he's 85 now, so it's, it's back when he was working, but the days of, um, you know, uh, the job loyalty or the work world has changed so much from when he was young, you know, that uh, you, you know, the, the days of the 45 year career seem to be uh, very rare, if at all. Um, and uh, because they move on, they move on to something better, there's something better, something better. Um, and that's our world. And there's, there's a part of that that we have to deal with. But the scary part is when it, when it affects our self worth, right? That's where there's a couple more statements here. Um, there are a couple more answers. I'll try to get everybody. Denise said, when you get told you are worthless and lazy over and over by a person, you feel that you aren't good enough for anyone. Yeah, so what you hear from one person, probably someone that's important to you, right? Probably someone that, that uh, has great influence in your life, and you hear that over and over again, you're going to transfer that to others. That's what, that, must be what, that must be who I am. That must be what everybody thinks of me. Very good, very true, not good, but very true, <laughs> very true. Um, Kim says, uh, good performance gets attention. Good, absolutely. And that is equated to relationships, but those relationships aren't the type of relationships that fuel our souls. Yeah, yeah, that's good. Excellent, good comments, good answers. I would say that bad performance gets attention. Yeah, yeah. A uh, gentleman said bad performance gets attention too. And that's true. Yeah. Extremes, right? Well, when you are not a performer, mm -hmm. per se, like in school. Yeah. And what's your next choice? Well, to be the actor out person. There you, yeah. yeah. So when you're not the performer in school, school you what's your next choice? That you're searching for to be the one that acts out. Through, uh, yeah. Between the performer. Yeah. Yeah. Good point. So there's a lot of reasons. We'll stop there. Thanks so much. Uh, online viewers, thank you for taking part like that as well. It really helps in all of you. Thank you for, for engaging that way. There's a lot of different reasons why we do, but they're all real, aren't they? They've all caused wounds. That's what they are. They, they're lies. There's some, there's some, there's a reality about performance and about standards and about accomplishments that's necessary. That's not bad, right? We, we need to do a good job on whatever it is. We need, we need to want to do a good job, to do our best, right? And so standards are, are going to be wherever we go in life. That's, we're not, I don't want you to hear, um, me saying that being successful and doing great are bad things. <laughs> On the contrary, not at all. But when it becomes, when it affects our self-worth, which is so often what it does, because it is so pronounced, because it is so important in this world, then that's how we measure ourself. And that's a lie from Satan. All right? Thanks, yeah. Let me just I may, yep. that second part of that, how does this affect your relationships? Because as you were just saying that, when you have somebody who their self-worth is wrapped up in their career or their job, their performance, it does, I can tell you, it, it, it affects the relationship. I mm -hmm. can tell you that. You know that. You know that I know that. Mm -hmm. So... Yeah, it's it's not a good thing because that that that's becomes their whole focus, and they can't help it. Yeah, and it is that that brings up a point that it's very much ingrained in who we are as Americans. 
it's very much ingrained in who we are in the Western world of, uh, because what's the normal greeting when you meet someone new? What do you do? What do you do? Oh, what do you do? Oh, yeah. What do you do? Mm -hmm. How important is that? Rather than how are you? Yeah. Or, or how's your family? It's, what do you do? Yeah. So often that's a key part of what the first thing we ask when we meet somebody new. What do you do? I'm guilty of it too. But that, that's, I think that's a, that's a part of what's ingrained in that performance. What you do is who you are. And no, yeah. not at all. Yeah. I know the time that I've spoken to parents, it's, it's that way when you get from, say, what we call middle school, throughout your high school, you've got to determine what you're going to school for, um, for a career. The, uh, our Green Beret uh, was mentioning when he was in Japan, seeing that the students there, that's what they're told, that they have to know from the time they're in middle school uh, through on up what they're going to be, what they're going to do. And if they're not, if their parents don't feel like they're going to succeed in one, it's like they're forced into something they don't even want to do. Mm -hmm. They can be forced into things they don't even want to do if they haven't figured it out themselves. Yeah. I think that kind of happens here too, though. Yeah, absolutely. Oh, yeah. Yeah, yeah we have we have levels of what's what's important, what's worthy, what's worthy work and what's not so worthy work, right? We Yeah, so we're guilty of that too. Yes? Mm -hmm. Yep. So the, the trauma as a child, uh, she says, could affect them as how they relate to others as well. So, yeah, very true. Well, I'm going to go to 2 Corinthians chapter 5. Um, I'm going to read that in a, in a bit. That's on the next slide. But it's a marvelous fact that once we trust Christ, to pay for our sins. And I think those of us that come to church, those of us that are believers, and I'm not going to assume that everybody is, but um, but if we trust Christ, it's a marvelous fact that when we do trust Christ to pay for our sins, we are completely forgiven and are considered fully righteous by God. That's a beautiful fact. But we got to incorporate that into our belief system, into our consciousness. And that's that get it factor that I'm talking about. Incorporating these truths into our conscious thinking will stimulate changes in our motivations to perform good deeds. And that's why Apostle Paul wrote here in 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verses 14 and 15, for the love of Christ controls us. Having concluded this, that one died for all, therefore all died, and he died for all. And that they who live should no longer live for themselves, but for him who died and rose again on their behalf. It's a transferring of that truth. And in the last uh, few minutes that we have, we're going to look at God's answer to this lie. All right. And again, we're just going to touch the surface. So I encourage you to dig in and get more of that from your book and from your workbook. But God does have an answer to this lie that so many of us struggle with. It permeates so many uh, of our lives and so many of our, our belief systems, maybe even that we're unaware of, but God has answers. And the first one is that we are justified. That's justification. That's God's answer. We are justified. Justified is declared righteous. Declared right. God declared that. God of the universe, God of creation, God Almighty, God who made you has declared that you are righteous before him. End of story. Amen. Not but, not if, just end of story. 
We are justified. That's a truth. What is it? Declared righteous. That's what it means. One way to think of it, you've probably heard Shane say this. I've said this for years. Uh, it's, it, you kind of think of the word justified is just as if I'd never sinned. That's how God sees us. Justified. Romans chapter 3, verses 21 to 24 is our passage for this. But now apart from the law, the righteousness of God has been made known to which the law and the prophets testify. The re this righteousness is given through faith in Jesus Christ to all who believe. This righteousness that, that the law never measured up to, because we can never... We can never fulfill every aspect of the law. No one could. That was to show us our sin, the righteousness of God beyond all that. But this righteousness of God is given through faith in Jesus Christ to all who believe. There is no difference between Jew and Gentile. For all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God, and all are justified freely by his grace through the redemption that came by Christ Jesus. Because of what Jesus Christ has done for us, his righteousness is ours. It's been imputed. It's been put into. It's been given. It's, it's how God sees us now, justified. We've been declared righteous because of Christ, not because of us because of Christ. And so now our identity is in Christ. I always like to think of it this way too. God looks down at us. Outside of Christ, he sees us for who we are. Sinners, uh, you know, to be judged. But when we believe in Christ, Christ comes in between. And that cross of Christ is in between us. And now the only, the only way that God sees us is through the cross. He sees us as Christ. He sees us with the righteousness of Christ. That is truth. We are justified. And that's a truth that I want you to hear. It's a truth I want you to believe. And it's a truth I want you to get. And I know that takes time. But continue to meditate on that and allow it to, to enter your conscious and your, your soul. The second part of God's answer is our identity in Christ. Our identity is in Christ. That's another truth. Who you are, your self-worth, completely regardless of what you've done or what you haven't done, completely regardless of your behavior, completely regardless of who you are on this earth or who you have been or who you will be, if you are in Christ, your identity is there. That's a truth. <laughs> Colossians 1.22 is our verse for this. But now he has reconciled you by Christ's physical body through death to present you holy in his sight without blemish and free from accusation. Let that sink in. Brought, reconciled is brought, brought near, brought together, right? Uh, uh, bringing a relationship that's estranged back together. Reconciled us by Christ's physical body through death. Okay, so his, him dying on the cross, his physical giving of his life was to present you and I holy. Holy in his sight, in God's sight, you are holy. That's who you are, without blemish and free from accusation. The enemy wants to point his finger at you and say, look what you did. Look what you didn't do. Look what you said. God, look at her. Look at him. 
How horrible. God doesn't, doesn't hear it. He doesn't see it. He says, away from me, Satan. Get out of here. There's no accusation. My. Colossians 1.22 there. And our third aspect of God's answer. The third truth in regards to God's answer is the work is God's. Who you are and your, your value, your self-worth, is not something you can muster. It's incredible. That's what we're trying to get here tonight so that you feel better about yourself. But it's not that you feel better about yourself because, because of what you've done or because of what you think. It's because of who Christ is. It's because of what God has done. And it takes all the pressure off. That's how I like to think about it takes all the pressure off. And it makes me want to live more holy. It makes me want to live and do my best, not out of self-worth, out of self-worth, thankfulness. But the work is God's. And I think that helps us with uh, from God's answer to realize that he did it. And he did it for you and he did it for you and he did it for me through Christ he did that because Romans 3:24 the next verse Romans 3:24 do i have it there there we go and all are justified there it is again and all are justified freely by his grace, through the redemption that came by Christ Jesus. Redemption is a beautiful word. Think of salvation, think of being saved, but redemption, being redeemed, is literally being purchased, being purchased out. The idea is they, in the slave market, that there was people that, you know, the slaves were being sold in the slave market, and then someone could purchase them and they were no longer a slave. And that's the picture here of redemption that, that through Christ, because of Christ, we have been purchased out of the slave market of sin. The, the slave market of sin, we've been purchased out of that and are no longer held in that. We are justified, that's how God sees us, freely by his grace through the work that Jesus Christ did. Again, it's not anything of ourself. And so feeling better about ourselves and understanding it this way should never enter into arrogance or pride because it wasn't, it, it's not me. And, and usually though, when we try to do our, ourself and it does come from us, that's more often where lack of self-worth comes in and where the lesser comes in but we are justified our identity is christ and the work is god's that's god's answer in a nutshell and there's a lot more to it but many of us understand that our salvation is based only on christ's death to pay for our sins but often we fail to apply this incredible truth to our lives that is the hard part I'm not going to pretend that that part is easy, but applying that truth and getting it is what we need. Deep within us is an unconscious belief that we must meet one or more arbitrary standards before we can please God. Often deep within us is an unconscious belief that we're not good enough, that we have to do this in order to be pleasing to God, in order to be pleasing to others and have a sense of self-worth. God wants to reach in and heal you of that through these truths. The false belief like that leads to wrong goals. It leads to tension, a tendency to use people to accomplish your own selfish wants and desires. And the fear of failing ranks up there as one of your greatest struggles. But God has provided a solution to our fear of failure. 
And the writer said, but the judicial act of justification, which we receive by faith in Jesus Christ, God has declared us free from the guilt of sin. We are completely forgiven as a result of Christ's blood, which was shed on the cross on our behalf. Not only has God forgiven our sinfulness, he has also given us Christ's righteousness, the worthiness to stand in his presence without fear of condemnation. Not only without fear of condemnation, without fear of accusation to be condemned, These are incredible truths, but they will have little impact on our lives unless we make them the foundation of our belief system. See, what's beneath every lie, what's beneath every, every, uh, uh, every issue like that is a belief. And we need to make this the foundation of our belief system. To do this, we must first learn how to identify thoughts that reflect Satan's deceptions. Our emotions serve as a checkpoint in the process. If we're filled with anger, fear, or tension, it's a good indication that we're believing one of Satan's lies. So the next time you experience a sense of distress, ask yourself, am I believing a lie? Just stop in that moment. Am I believing a lie about something? And if so, which one? Then seek to identify it, identify the lie, reject it, and replace it with the truth of God's word, with the truth of what God says about you. See, if you don't replace it with that truth, then you're, you're easily sucked right back into it. And that's why James says in James chapter 4, submit to God, resist the devil and he'll flee from you. There's, a, there's, a, there's God's part. We just read some beautiful truths about God's done his part for you and me in regards to our self-worth. We belong to him. He's done his part. He's given us everything, right? And he, he has blessed us. We have so much in him. That is where our worth resides, right? So God's done his part, and yet we have personal responsibility too. We have personal responsibility to apply that truth. And for some of us, that'll take longer than others, but it'll happen. It'll happen. The Holy Spirit will make that happen for you. And when James says, submit to God, resist the devil, who's the only one that can do that? Who's the only one that can submit to God and resist the devil? You. Yeah. God, I can't do that for you. God can't do that for you. There's a, a story of a, of a teacher who was teaching that principle. And he was telling the, the, the audience that, um, you know, how many, and it was Christians. And he would always ask, um, uh, how, many, how many of you wake up at night and, and just have the sense of an evil, evil presence uh, at night? You wake up often that way. And, and, you know, he would say often a third of the room would always raise their hand. Um, and he, he talked about the, the re answer to that really is, is personal responsibility, but it's submit to God and resist the devil and he'll flee from you because God's given you everything you need for godliness, right? He's, he's given us all, all the spiritual blessings from the spiritual realms, from the heavenly realms. Uh, we, 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 we're learning that. We've learned that. Um, but we have a responsibility too, right, to submit to that and to apply it. And this young lady came up to him. She was 25, 26 years old, came up to him afterwards and said, I don't think I can do that. I've, I've been dealing with this exact thing that you said every night. I wake up and there's an evil presence there. I just, and it just feels like Satan's there and I, I can't sleep. And I wake up and I feel tormented. And in fact, uh, she was there at the conference because she was on uh, sick leave from work. And the only way she was, has been able to, to deal with it is to actually live with her parent, move back in with her parents. In fact, even sleep with her parents at 25 years old. It's just been that horrific for her. And he tried to talk with her and he said, that is the truth. Of, you know, you've been given everything. So submit to God, resist the devil, and he'll flee from you. Is something you can, can do. She goes, I don't think I can do that. 
And well, he said, it, 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 being nice to her, he, well, it's really quite simple. I, you know, even telling his kids that he has, you know, when they struggle with something to do that. And so he didn't think she would do it. And, but the next day she came back, she said it worked. Um, she actually did it and, and it does work, but that's a personal response. She prayed and prayed and prayed that God would take it away, but God never did. Does that mean of God to do that? If he would have taken that away and, and she, she would have never learned the strength that she has and the authority that she has over the evil things in her life, there's that personal responsibility too. So I leave you with that, that there is that side of it, but to know that the truth of God's word is there for us. And, and uh, so that's the first part. And we'll come back together uh, next week to carry on on the next the approval trap is where we'll end up next week. So I encourage you to read and to do the workbook. Like I say, don't, don't worry about getting it all done before next week. But put it into practice in your life. This, I, this is just a book. It's just a tool. But I believe God can use it in your life. God bless you.